Hi everyone. Um, I've gotten a lot of requests for different videos. Videos on anxiety, videos on parenting, videos on different things about kids. Um, and so everything I come up with feels a little inadequate. And um, there isn't, you know, I kept thinking there isn't any one way to, to cover everything um, or easily, you know, I think we are so as a people inundated with read this book, apply this concept, apply this procedure and um, you're going to fix it. One, two, three. There used to be a book called One, Two, Three Magic. Uh, and so I haven't, uh, I hadn't made anything and I'm exhausted. I'm sure everybody's exhausted. We're all exhausted. But here's what came to me. So for what it's worth, this to me is the golden rule for being an exceptional parent. And that is to be able to genuinely try to see the world through the lens of your children. What do I mean by that? It is not as easy as it sounds. It's not, it's not easy at all. Um, it, it, for most of us, our earliest memories are, we may say it's four or five, but it's really usually more like six or seven or eight or nine or 10. Um, and so sometimes we get confused. So we loved Halloween. And so we think our three-year-old might love it, but we don't remember Halloween when we were three. And in fact, it's very scary. So it's fun for grown-ups, but not for kids. That's, that's, those are the times when we're seeing the world the way we want our children to see the world instead of the way that our children see the world. So I just finished taping a lecture for a child development class for teachers. And what I found myself saying was that to be an exceptional teacher is to be able to view the world from the perspective of the child. And to do that, you need to understand certain things about child development. You need to understand, not a lot, some things, that a child is born with some genetics, right? So a child is born with a temperament. Are they slow to warm up? Um, do they sleep while you're vacuuming? Or are they easily roused? And do they have a harder time falling asleep? These are some of the biological predispositions that we're born with that will influence our personality later in life. Layer one, um, any cognitive issues. So any born with any health difficulties, any kind of neurological or genetic um, uh, abnormalities, for lack of a, a prettier word for that, are gonna impact everything about how they go through their developmental phases. And then you have this little human being who is, who is starting with just that biology and starting from a place of no language or symbolic anything. Uh, and that's always the hardest thing for my students is to be able to put themselves back into a place prior to language. It's even almost impossible to talk about because as we think about it, we use our language and our concepts and our ideas and our cognition to try and imagine what the experience of an infant is. But the experience of an infant is without words. It is without symbols. It is without objects. A child is born into a sensory experience of light impulses and sound impulses and tactile impulses. That's what we mean by sensory, right? Taste. Um, and those things are without label. They are moments of uh, equilibrium or disequilibrium. There are moments of satisfaction or dissatisfaction, and we are completely vulnerable to the grown-ups in our world to keep us alive, right? To keep us fed, warm, dry, happy. And as we begin to experience the repetition of these sensory moments, from day to day, we create memory traces and things begin to be like predictable, for lack of a better word. Predictable, right? And then it's like that for, what, a year and a half? 
you know, you begin to have receptive understanding of language and then you get rudimentary language in your toddlerhood and then you can walk, you can at least crawl after your mother or you can run after your mother. You can protest, you can say no. You begin to see that I am an I and we are separate, inside, outside, object, object. But think about how long that takes. And then from ages two to six, there's like this huge uh, explosion of development uh, and personality. And so there are these layers of what a child is experiencing at different ages and how they understand the world at different ages. And so you have your biology, and then you layer on top of that the, um, the psychological response to that biological experience. And then on top of the psychology and emotional aspect of that, there's the cognitive um, learning thought process. Boom, that's layered on top of that. And so how do kids learn? A lot of parents are asking themselves that question right now because you're trying to teach kids at home and you're looking at it and you're like, I don't know how to teach math. How do I teach my kid math? How do I teach them to understand um, that X is a variable and that, you know, it's a missing variable and you solve for X, you know, how do you, how do you do that? Which is why we're like, oh my gosh, teachers are so great. But the thing that teachers understand isn't, isn't just that X is a variable, but how children are seeing the world and how at what age they can understand that symbols mean something, right? So just like X is an unknown variable in higher ordered math, um, that round thing is a ball. It really is the same idea. It's just that at different ages, they have different capacities. And, and so it's important to understand what your child can understand at different ages, okay? And so with everything that's going on, when I did the video about talking to kids about difficult things, what I was keeping in mind is the way that we explain things like the virus or the way we're going to have to explain what it means to go out into the world and wear a mask all the time um, or why they're not going to get that close to strangers or that hugging and shaking hands might be different. We're going to have to approach it understanding the world from their point of view because if we don't talk to kids about things, right, the rule, kids can get through anything it can be talked about, but if we don't talk to kids about things from their point of view, understanding their point of view, which is why when I say ask a kid what they think first because that kid will share with you where they are in their thinking, right? They can only see the world through the lens of their current state of development. So they can only see um, a germ it, 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 as, a, as a, a concrete kind of animal, right? It goes into a certain category. Um, or they can only process emotions to the extent that they've been taught what those emotions are. And oftentimes, and this is what's happening to all of us, by the way, uh, when you're faced with trauma, and acute stress, we all tend to do this thing that's we're calling regression, to regress. And so you'll find yourselves craving food from your childhood, maybe comfort foods, we call them. And it could be all kinds of bizarre things from your childhood, popsicles, all of a sudden you're like, I want popsicles, I have to get to the store to get popsicles. Um, or, um, I don't know, crawling under warm laundry, I, I, whatever it is you might do to try and create a sense of feeling safe. Children regress in that same way. They may be much needier now. It isn't just you that's feeling more irritated with your kid. It's that your kids are also needier right now. They may have trouble sleeping. They may regress in their potty training. They may, um, I don't know, not take care of their bodies. Or um, teenagers may sleep too much. Or there's like this regression to an earlier phase of development. And they rely so heavily on the grown-ups around them to sort of scaffold, that's the word in, in teaching language. Um, think of a scaffold, what a scaffolding is, right? Like, like when you're building something, you create a scaffold and you stand on it and you can build higher. Same thing is true when you're learning something. But what happens when, as parents, we're exhausted and we can't provide scaffolding because we're barely holding our own selves up, then the system can feel like it's collapsing. And so in moments like that, when you're feeling so much anxiety and you're feeling like a complete failure and understand that there are certain things, one, like being a teacher, that you, 
you, you, you shouldn't do. We wouldn't have four years of education to become a teacher if you could, anybody could just do it. Even parents who homeschool, they put a lot of more time and effort into homeschooling than you might think. Learning how to be a good homeschool parent uh, takes way more time, I think, than anybody really ever gives homeschool parents credit for. Um, but if you can stop when you are in a moment of frustration or you're in a moment of, I just can't do it anymore, if you can stop and breathe and even just sit on the floor, like get lower to the ground, you know, shorter, like a kid, and just start thinking, how is my kid seeing the world? If you can just do that, then you can make a ton of mistakes, a ton of mistakes, and your child will feel understood. Your child will still feel the emotional connection to you. There was a supervisor who once told me years and years and years ago, and I'm sure I'm paraphrasing it at this point in my life, but that um, children forgive mistakes of the head. It's the mistakes of the heart that they have a harder time with. And so as long as your heart is in the right place and you're trying to see the world from the perspective of your child and you're trying to understand how concrete is their thinking, how emotionally scared are they right now, um, and you're asking questions about what they're feeling or you're trying to help them name the feeling, um, then you're doing the thing called parenting. You are being there, you are being connected, you are being in relationship. And whether or not you're good at teaching math is just not important. Um, whether or not your kid starts school next year, maybe not where they're supposed to be with regard to math. You know, that's why we love teachers because a lot of kids are gonna be starting school next year, maybe not where we would normally want them to be in a standardized kind of way. Um, but they will be healthy and they will be there and the teachers will figure it out. They'll figure it out. They will figure out a way to help kids get caught up. They will bridge the gap um, and, and get them to where they need to be because that is their job and, and they have a better sense of how to do that than you do. Your job as a parent is to help your child become an emotionally solid functioning human being who is capable of learning from other people. Um, and, and behaving in social settings and things of that nature. And so if you can just, just try to understand the developmental point of view of your child uh, and, and, and just thinking about that and wondering about that and asking them about what they're thinking, I think is probably for me in my experience working with families for whatever, 20 some years, the sign of, like that's the thing that makes me go, oh, this kid's gonna be okay. This kid's going to be okay because this parent is so invested in trying to understand the, the world from their point of view and helping them um, correct errors in their perceptions and feel safe and feel like the world is an okay place to explore. And that to me is what you would consider exceptional parenting. It isn't how many flashcards your kid can do. It isn't how fast your kid can run. It isn't how many A's they get. It's whether or not they can connect to other people, communicate effectively with other people, and um, show curiosity uh, in whatever form it, it, it comes in, and that they feel understood by their parents. And just because you understand something doesn't mean you need to fix, handle, or change it. Sometimes what kids have to learn is to sit with a feeling and know that the feeling will pass, and know what they can control and what they can't control, and then how to respond to that. So I think everybody just needs to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out and uh, get off the, uh, the competition hamster wheel when it comes to successful parenting and understand that the connection with your child is probably more important, I think, than anything else providing a safe structure, an authoritative parenting style. Research says that's the best one. You know, and if you want to hear more, if you're, if you're that kind of person, if you're an intellectualized person, um, I ended up having to do audio 
taped uh, lectures on child development over PowerPoints for my teaching students because we moved to online classes for child development. And they're on my YouTube page, and uh, I, I think I'm just going to leave them there. Uh, so it's my perspective on child development as it is taught to future early childhood educators. So if you're that kind of person, feel free, go take a look at them. Uh, but if not, then just take a deep breath in, take a deep breath out. And when you're feeling really frustrated, ask yourself, okay, how is my child understanding this current situation that we're in? Whatever that might be. And see if that doesn't help. Because uh, until you understand how your child sees the world, then you can't even pick a program that's going to work for them, right? Love and logic, that's a great one. If your child responds to it. You know, oftentimes we say, well, this program works really well, behavior modification, whatever it might be. And then when it doesn't work for your child, and, and professionals will say this to you, well, you didn't implement it properly. You know what? Or you don't really believe in that system, and so you didn't implement it in an authentic way, and your kid felt that, and so it wasn't authentic for you, so it wasn't authentic for them. You know, there's no one way to do this thing called parenting, and and I think as long as you are connected to your child and understanding, understand if your temperament is the same as your child, doesn't mean they're going to be just like you. If your temperament is opposite to your child, you're the one that has to adjust. Your child isn't going to adjust to fit you. You have to adjust to fit them. That is the hardest part and the most important part of parenting. So those are my thoughts on that. There's no magic here. Stay connected. Understand when you need to take a break so you can stay connected. Um, you might have to hide in the bathroom, <laughs> those kinds of things. I know it can be hard to take a break sometimes. Uh, and, and try to take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out and understand how your child sees the world. And don't assume that you know how your child sees the world because of how you as an adult see the world or how you think you remember seeing the world when you were their age. Every child is so unique and made up of so many pieces of the puzzle that creates the, the fabric of who they are, um, that they'll never be exactly like you. And so you have to really get to know your child as they become who they are. I'm rambling now. I hope this helps. Put in the comment section questions I can try to answer. Thanks. Good night.